Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> uh, this is British American Culture, and this is the last class. Um, this is a review, and um, you, if you watch this or don't watch it, it's your choice. Uh, as I promised, I said I would sort of talk about you know key um, words or key concepts that we talked about this semester. And so this is the video. Um, the production values, as usual, are quite low. Uh, there's a, a bit of a reflection on the, the board. And, um, you know, I, I don't have any assistance or anything. So this is just, uh, let's just pretend that I'm in class like usual, like bad fashion sense and all the rest of it. <clears throat> um, in past classes, some of the comments have been related to how difficult this class is. Um, this is the board from about two months ago. And uh, one of the things that Korean students often say is, oh, it's a, um, the final exam has a material from the beginning of the class. And I say yes, and that's uh, not a very popular thing. But I would like you to not just get a good grade in the class, but I would hope that you remember um, important things such as princes and the Crusades and Magna Carta that are on the board here. Um, I, I recorded some of the videos from home um, from my house with a different board. But this one was still here um, from maybe April, something like that. So the, the medieval times in the, I, I wrote this word identity. This is very important. Uh, that why are, why are we studying English? Why are we talking about British culture and American culture? Why is that um, important to understand? Um, I think basically it's an economic a reality that to trade and to make more money that um, people want to be able to communicate and we are in the information age, and we are, we've talked about this a little bit, not that much, but you know, Henry II, uh, probably you remember me saying, uh, of the Henrys, Henry II and Henry VIII are the most important. Uh, Henry II is very important because he has a relationship with France, in Ireland and Scotland and England, and it's, it's sort of a, a prototype for the British Empire that's going to, uh, you know, develop M hundreds of years later, 700, 600 years later, Shakespeare 500 years later, and um, there, there's some um, disagreement about, you know, why the, the British Empire developed the way it did, but I think one of the things is simply the fact that um, as, a, as an island, as a sort of remote place on the edge of Europe and um, having this connection with France, having this connection with Europe, and, but at the same time being sort of close to the Atlantic, like close to, closer to America at the same time, is an essential part of the British culture. So it's very hard to teach about British culture and American culture in one class, but I, I, I hope you've seen that the American culture is sort of um, developed from English culture. Uh, it's mostly the English Civil War, right? In the 16th century, um, you have Henry VIII, sort of separating England from the rest of Europe by religion. And Germany does the same thing because of Martin Luther and then Northern Europe does the same thing. Uh, and like it, it creates a, another barrier, uh, not a physical barrier, but an intellectual barrier and communication barrier. Um, so people start to 
focus on English culture more and English language more. And that produces Shakespeare and Queen Elizabeth. But as we talked about, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of issues with the English state, with the British state that they have to resolve. And Queen Elizabeth doesn't solve them. Lots of people think that Queen Elizabeth was uh, one of the greatest English queens or kings, and I agree. I think she should probably be called Elizabeth the Great, but as she got older, of course, just like me and the rest of us, um, maybe at a certain point your intellectual ability um, reaches its limit or political ability or everything. You, you go past your prime and um, she, you don't, you don't um, quit being the queen. You have to do it until you die. So it doesn't matter like what your health is, mentally or physically. Queen Elizabeth was not in a good, you know, state at the end of her life, and that's something everybody forgets. Um, Shakespeare wrote his dramas in the 1590s when Queen Elizabeth was on the decline. And um, King James came down from Scot Scotland and made the English Bible uh, and um, ruled over uh, the British, like, uh, it's not an empire yet, but the British, you can say it's a, he wanted to make it um, Scotland, England unified, but you know he's the king of Scotland and the king of England at the same time. So Henry II did this kind of thing, but everything kind of fell apart. Uh, the Hundred Years' War um, intervened. So let me let me just go through, um, sort of point by point, some things that you need to remember to read or remember to do before you um, prepare before you're going to write the exam in preparation for the exam. Um, the introduction in the textbook is very brief uh, it probably doesn't cover as much as I wanted it to but remember we did the first assignment on cultural social and historical context related to cultural studies that was the first assignment and the second one was related to American contradictions so obviously that could be a potential question on the exam uh, do you remember what social or cultural um, or historical context means? And what are the major American contradictions like um, the prison system or the healthcare system or of course human rights, right? Um, starting with slavery and um, going, you know, related to immigration and racism and uh, minorities who are represented in the United States, like how the Constitution says everybody's equal, but reality is different, right? So you, you have to consider those things. Um, going into the first chapter, the, the most important thing is to remember that um, England and British culture is multicultural. So originally it's a Celtic country. The Britons are people who are named by the Romans, uh, but they're a Celtic civilization. And um, Wales and Ireland and Scotland and Cornwall, the, the western parts of the islands, in, including Ireland itself, um, they are all Celtic you know, in, linguistically and culturally, and that we don't have a lot of information about them because they didn't normally write things down. But the Romans came in and they did write things down and they built a lot of things. So we can, we can discover um, what the culture was like before the Romans by digging in the ground. We can find these kind of ev the evidence of agriculture and roads and uh, creative ability and culture 
by the Celtic civilization, but the Roman one is much, much clearer, has much more information, and it's more recent. So, you know, we don't know if somebody, you know, there was a, there was probably cultures that existed before the Celtics, but we don't really know about them because the Romans wrote about the Celtics and they called them the Britons. So the, now we call them the Britons because of the Romans. And many of them, not many of them, but some of them, uh, where they had a lot of um, opportunities because of the Roman Empire, because it went all the way from Scotland, all the way to Syria, to the Middle East. Uh, and there was trade, and there was architecture, and there was technology, uh, and, and uh, security, and stability. It's kind of like, it's kind of like being connected to the international system now, you know, like Korea is, with uh, technology and the internet and um, the cap capitalist market and everything, stocks and everything. That's kind of like what Britain was connected to when they were in the Roman Empire and then the Roman Empire collapsed and everything in Europe became unstable, right? So uh, <clears throat> during that period, Irish people, Scottish people, but especially German people invaded. And we call them Anglo-Saxons, which are uh, basically Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. There's three groups. They come from Germany and they settle in, in England. They settle and they create kingdoms and they fight with each other until the Vikings come and, and attack them. And then they, they become unified because they have to defend against the Vikings. Really, the Vikings and the French, um, the French uh, state, as it becomes later <clears throat> the French state, the Franks um, has a large role in defining what English identity is because they, they just know that, well, we have to defend our homes and we have to fight. It's always, there's a reason we say home field advantage, right? When you, you play a soccer game or you play a baseball game or, or basketball game in your hometown or like in your home country, like if Korea plays against uh, another country, you know, competitively in the Olympics or World Cup or something, and you know, they we host, people come to our background, our, our backyard, as it were, uh, then people consider this an advantage. And it's true, because you're fighting for something. Uh, that, that's really the reason why the Americans also defeat the British in their Revolutionary War almost 2,000 years later, pretty much because they're defending their, their, their homes. It, it, the situation doesn't change dramatically. They just have to defend their home ground, their their backyards. <clears throat> so Vikings try to take over and they, they do for a, a time dominate um, British culture for several hundred years. It's called the Viking Age. And people are always terrified that any day there might be a Viking raider um, Viking group that that lands, you know, especially on, on the, the coast, especially on the sea, that they will, you know, um, appear out of the ocean suddenly, and uh, the English, the British, Anglo-Saxons will be unprepared. Um, so the Vikings cause that kind of, um, you know, um, consolidation of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. So they go from seven kingdoms to one. Uh, Al, we talked about Alfred the Great. So Alfred the Great is the, the iconic figure uh, who stops the Vikings and, and re, retakes the whole area, which will become England. 
it, he's, I, I'm gonna say, I said he was kind of like Sejong. He's kind of like Sejong, but he's kind of like Gwangae To, maybe, if you're Korean. Um, he's milit military, militarily, he is, is um, very, very accomplished. I don't, Sejong also was a um, famous general, I guess, but Gwangae To is more famous for resisting the Chinese which is sort of like the, the Viking um, age in that, you know, the, the Chinese empire was expanding and taking over everywhere and then Gwangae To stopped them. That's what Alfred did too. And, uh, but the next people to invade are the Normans and the English fail to repel them. So Harold dies and William the Conqueror becomes the king. And uh, that's why it's so hard to spell things or remember English words and names because a lot of them are French. 25% of English uh, is considered to be derived from French. So um, people have said, professors have said, not me, but I, I will agree, to a certain extent. Um, French is the language of the table and English is the language of the farm, the field. So like when you talk about, for example, you talk about meat, you say twejigogi is like pig meat, right? In English you say pig, but the, the word for the meat is pork. And if you um, think about beef, or cows, or chicken, and uh, poulet, <laughs> they don't say that. Um, bir birds, um, chicken, chicken is probably ex the exception, but um, sheep, sheep in Korean, yangogi, uh, sheep meat, and in Korean, it's, uh, in English, it's mutton. Mouton. So, boeuf, mouton, and pork, these are all derived from French words. And they, they uh, are related to the manners. Um, we say cuisine, you can say kitchen, or you can say food, uh, or you can say cuisine, like French cuisine, or English cuisine, or you can say Japanese cuisine, or Korean cuisine. That is a French word. Uh, cuisine just sounds fancier, I have to say. I guess that's the way to say it. And fancy is also a, originally a French word. So you've got uh, all these um, cuisines uh, rather than all these different foods, which cuisine sort of means like cultural food. And uh, that's all because of William the Conqueror because French, Norman French, was it was the language of the English court for hundreds of years. So anybody who was uh, rich, anybody who was important, used French as the language of the court. And, and court also is a French word. So like courtesy or manners, these are all French things. These are all French vocabulary. Um, derived from Middle French or Old French. Um, over, over time though, people started to form their own identity oriented around language and ethnicity. Uh, there is really no ethnic difference between French people and um, English people. I, I think I'm one, I'm, I'm I have a one thirty second part of me is Italian or something. Uh, and uh, some of my ancestors were French, some of them were Scottish, some of them were English, some of them were Welsh. Nobody is uh, purely English. That's uh, not, Anglo-Saxon is, is a creation. That's related to King Arthur, right? So you gotta think um, originally British, British, that's the reason why we call it British culture, not English culture, because British culture is by definition 
multicultural. So it, it includes India, Canada, like me, <clears throat> um, people from Ireland, people from Scotland, people from Wales, people from Korea, if they move to uh, the UK, that you also, you can be British. If you want to be, you can be a British person. Uh, any of you are, are um, ethnically qualified, I should say. Um, I don't know the other qualifications, but you, you can become a British citizen. Doesn't matter where you're from. Um, it's a global concept. Uh, that obviously that has some bad, it, the, the history of that globalization is not um, necessarily positive. We talked about imperialism um, about a month ago and you have to uh, recognize imperialism has some benefits, some, some demerits. Globalization uh, creates opportunities for some people and um, prevents other people from succeeding. So it, this is another um, lesson from this class is just to think about what the, the consequences are. Uh, this, I think I've talked too much about the, the original British concept. So you have to go through this class from here to from chapter two to chapter seven. Chapter eight is not included. Uh, so I know everybody wants to get a good grade and the multiple choice section is difficult. Uh, some people say that the class is hard. Uh, that's true. It's, it's not easy to remember all these things. I, I think that, like I said, every quiz, there's several major concepts. So like if we, if we go from the beginning, let's just say the four or five cultures, there's four invading cultures, Celtics, Celtics are the original people. And then there's four, you know, invading peoples that follow them. Um, that is kind of one topic, one concept. But as I told you, you won't have to um, write a short answer question about the uh, British culture, British cultural topics, just about the American ones. So that was, you know, from the midterm, you had to say, what is the you know important concept about you know what's the most significant idea about each invading culture in the United Kingdom for this <clears throat> for this uh, exam it it will be the answer the short answer questions will only be from Amer from fourteen ninety two from Columbus forward so I can add, I can definitely ask you. Like what is the impact of uh, the Columbian exchange? That means that Christopher Columbus or Christophe Colombo comes to America and let, what is the consequences of that exchange of diseases and money and people and animals? You have to talk about that. Obviously the American Revolution uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin. We talked about how those people are important and how the American Republic became uh, started. And after that war, how slavery and the American Civil War became the most important event in the 19th century. Industrialization, which started in Britain, but continued in America and Germany and France and other countries, could be a possible question. And imperialism, tell me the positive things or tell me the negative things about the imperial system. And then we have the last few lectures that I did uh, the 
Hollywood, how Hollywood is organized into four eras, including my own edition, the fifth, 21st century um, period, and how the American century is divided into three parts with two crises breaking up those three parts. Those are all big events which you should be able to write something. You have to try and express yourself in English, write something, you know, in a sentence form, and that's the end of the exam. There's 40 multiple choice, and there's two short answer questions, which are five points each, and that's it. And then summer vacation for all of you. I thank, I thank you, all of you, especially international students. I appreciate uh, you joining the class. Some of you have done very well this semester, which um, I have to congratulate. I, I met some students from different countries, which I, you know, sometimes you, you have to introduce yourself to the professor because there's too many students. Um, there's 50 of you, 52, I think. So all of you study, you know, do your best. And that's all um, I, I think you need to take away from this class is apply the cultural lessons to your own culture and your own life and try and think carefully um, about why British and American culture is important and also think about why your country is Korea or Brunei or Uzbekistan. I, I'm probably forgetting some people. France or Germany. If that's where you're from, you also have to think why it's important to know this information and to understand if you understand another culture better than your own, then you're not alone because that's what I do. I'm a Canadian person and I maybe um, know British and American culture better than my own culture. So that's uh, not a problem. It's a, just, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a, your own journey to understand how culture develops. So um, I'll see you on Friday and uh, this will be uploaded by Wednesday night. So uh, I hope most of you watch this video and um, do well on, on, uh, on Friday. See you at 11 on Friday.